Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, technical track for the LifeRay uh, Digital Solutions Forum. Our first talk this morning is by uh, LifeRay Senior Consultant, Samsa Solomon. He's going to be talking about the Rock Solid LifeRay project. Um, I, I won't give you an introduction because I'll probably mess it up, so I'll let Samsa work away. <laughs> yeah. The Usually what happens with these uh, presentations is that you just say that keep a presentation and I'm thinking that I have to keep, do some presentation of what I do for work. And I see in my work, I see library projects. The goal uh, of this presentation is give you some kind of guidance that you should take care of when you actually, so more people are coming so we can wait a little bit. Okay, let's wait. Are we just coming in? It's a first slide still. Okay, now. Yeah, now we can now we can clear it. Okay. Everybody's seen, so okay. Yeah, my presentation subject is life, a rock solid life ray project. And the background of this presentation is that I'm actually seeing the project that partners are doing, customers are doing. I used to work for partners, so I've also had experience of the full cycle project myself. And your my goal is that from this presentation would give you guidance for your life ray project implementation so it would be more successful. So it would be solid as a finished bedrock. Yeah, my name is Samsa Sulman. I work as a senior consultant for life ray. I've been working in the Vita product more than 10 years and inside life ray company around five years. Uh, so I, I've done several, seen a lot of life implementation, as I said, and before the joining life, I used to partner, and we did full life cycle projects. And actually, the part of this uh, uh, presentation, history and story and experiences are actually coming before the life rate. As inside life rate, I haven't done full life cycle projects, but I think my experience from that far is still valid. Actually, I see when I see you clients I, and parents, I see that I still have something to say to you. So I split this presentation for basically we have a technology. So what, what are the, so here I'm going to give you some tips. What do you should take care of uh, in your library project? You will go through a little bit library architecture, a little bit coding tips, some KVATs, what is there? And I'm going to demonstrate also your team. And uh, I'm going to demonstrate a team of the successful project because usually I see one of the members of the team missing most of the projects. But in the past, I have had a good project team and I, it, was, it has been very successful. Third, we are going to talk about development process. And first, I'm going to show you about like the so-called simple process, and then we are going to talk about continuous development. And at last, we are going to talk about testing and how you should actually involve testing in your life report and how, what you should look and what kind of level of testing we have. So your chosen technology is a life ray, so we actually should look of the life ray also. If you wouldn't uh, look life ray, this would be basically as life ray project would be like any other software project in sense of process. So let's look uh, about, li let's look a little bit about life ray architecture. So this is basically life ray architecture. It has been there like many years. The Architecture itself, if you, if you lay out like this, hasn't been changed since 5.2. In a DXP, we basically have a modularization. 
and this module actually fits inside this architecture. But when you step back, you should actually click, see this uh, architecture, and what, what you see there is there are frameworks. So this also should mean for you that LifeRay is also a development framework. So we bring a lot of frameworks that you should use. So you also should look what we bring for you. Then in the middle, you see LifeRay services. And basically in this box, you see also the word service builder. And as I call LifeRay's architecture as a service builder architecture. And, and the best practice to develop for LifeRay is to actually do the same way as we do. It has clear benefits. It provides you transactional layer. So if you have many people doesn't know that if you do run something inside LifeRay's services, you're running those inside transaction. If you don't know what is transaction, it basically means if you do several steps and one of them fails, all of them will fail. Then we have a LifeRace information architecture. I see in a project that people know how to code. They create the features that we have inside LifeRay. They might create the extranet with the one LifeRay site, but they are not example just using permissions to divide the usage of the site, who is seeing what and what, what are people using. They, are not, they don't know how to example use LifeRay site templates, page templates. They don't know how to use LifeRay permission management or user management. Inside LifeRay, we have also, you can run one LifeRay instance, you can have multiple instances of LifeRay. So this actually feels, feels for end user like a normal LifeRay installations. Normally, you are not using these, but uh, these are very useful when you're actually doing testing. And when I visit for the clients and the partners and I look at the project, the many times there's a question, do I have to use a service pillar? Who is using service pillar here? Two hands. <laughs> Okay, so basically service pillar is a tool what we use in LifeRay. Some people like it, doesn't. Some people doesn't. It brings you this like transactional behavior and it's very fast to develop. It brings you uh, naming patterns. It's a code generation tool and this is the one of the objections that people are saying, I don't like it, it's generating code. But it's generating code it's helping you. You shouldn't care about it. You just basically write the XML, and then you run Service Builder, and you have a whole service layer with caching and everything on place. Because of the Service Builder in our uh, architecture, there are some things that Service Builder is doing for you, like, uh, like, uh, uh, create, read, and update methods. In LifeRay APIs, we have these methods, and some of these methods have been overridden in other methods. So there might, there's a dangerous place there. If you're creating your application, you might be using wrong methods. Good example, if you create a user to the API, there is a local service method called add user. So if you use this method, which is taking parameters as a user entity, you are using wrong method. It's just creating a row in a LifeRay database, but nothing else. You are basically creating corruption in your LifeRay database, and you will be punished after that. When you do upgrade or something, you will follow some kind of bug. Instead, you should use actually uh, other method, which, which has nicely almost 40 parameters, but that's actually the correct one you should use. Another API in LifeRay which is hard to use is the Document Media API. So if you are adding files in LifeRay, so this is like a multi-layered API. So there's a, basically there's a APIs in lower end, 
like DL file entry local services and DL folder local services. And many times in a project I see that these have been used. They kind of like feels working, but I've seen in like when you do like fixed back installation, something breaks. Basically, you should use this higher level APIs, DL app service and DL app local service when you're actually developing against the document media. That also allows to use same API when you're developing against other repositories of Liferay. And Liferay is a portal. So the basic uh, functionality of the portal is to aggregate content with the different integrations. And these integrations, sometimes when you, you are in production, they might be a problem. If, if you look like architecture, I usually draw a line like critical system boundary. And this critical system boundary means that this system should, should be up and running if your life is up and running. You should minimize, actually, if your integrations are not able to handle the SLA, you should minimize, actually, the this effect. So you would actually should move the critical boundary only for the life ray. So if your integration is not able to manage its SLA, your life ray should be up and running. Netflix example has built this uh, circuit breaking pattern tool, high tricks, and that's something like you can actually integrate in your life ray. Last thing about technology is that when you develop for Liferay, you should actually also look at the Liferay source code. You should include Liferay source code in your project. You should look at Liferay source code and see how you do things. You can debug inside Liferay source code. And with Enterprise also, we develop your source code. You can even patch this source code. And the idea here is behind is that you actually would actually use it. The import in that is a little bit hard for the developer studio. You actually have to use the script that you can find from this link. And then you run it and you can see all the folders inside one Eclipse project. So let's talk about quickly about the development team and then we move on the development process. So Basically, if you have a development team here, it has a multiple of members. And we actually, talk, I'm talking to talk about that there should be only role. So you don't have to think about there's a five people, but there's a five roles in your development team. So basically, you have a Sara, the product owner. And the purpose of product owner is actually keep the vision of the team, what she wants. And also, give prioritizations to features that she likes to have. Then we have a Sami, the Scrum Master. He's a project manager, Scrum Master, whatever. And his job is to remove obstacles so that team actually can work. Then we have our development team. And our development team, there is always architect, always name of my father. And it also means helpful, which means also that architect should be helpful. So he is an expert developer. He knows the overall architecture of the design system. And his job is also to look, look the quality of the code. Then we have a Daniel developer. And he is a full stack developer. I know, I'm not making difference between uh, web, web developers or backend developers. So we can think that he is a full stack developer. And then we have a last member of the team. And this is the guy I usually don't see. So who we, who we are missing? QA. Exactly, basically, yes. yes. <laughs> this is something like we don't have it. It's the Tommy the tester. And in Finnish language, we write Tommy with Y. I, yeah, I actually used to have a tester called Tommy in my project. And it was great, great to have the guy in a project who was actually taking care of testing. And tester is one of the roles that you shouldn't actually mix up with the other developer roles. Because it's something like it requires concentration of your project. So it's, it's uh, looking different aspects. If he's doing development, 
he's not able to test properly. He should be also kind of like programmer. He should be able to automate his work. So he's not like trying everything like. So he's not a monkey. He's a really smart guy. My feeling is that having good te de tester is undervalued professional and actually really hard to be a good tester. So from this development team, we move on development process and I'm gonna first show you about the simple development process. So basically this is the same kind of process that you see most of the time when there's no like order in the place on a development. It's a manual development process. So we have a product owner, Sara, and she has a vision for the project. And the development team has arrived to solve her problem. And then we have all the environments already set up. And Sara gives the product team for the inputs. I want this kind of feature in my library. And then development team is actually creating a solution for them. Development team is storing the solution also their version control. And then they are deploying the package, the test environment, so you can test it. There's a little bit order on that process too. So, so SAR is able to test. SAR will test the new feature. Well, actually she's not testing, she's just trying out. She's not a tester, but she loves it. So then Sara and development team make next day make the decision that okay, they will release and this on the production. Of course, they think a little while, it's not something like it's just okay. And team takes them, they build the project. They deploy that the thing to the production. Sara has marketing and things, a lot of load coming, and of course, inevitable will happen. Side is crashing. Well, they have tested the system, so why this did happen? Or did they? First of things is that what I see in a development process is that I've seen in real life, if the developer is building the packages in his own computer, something can fail. It's not a constant build. There might be different developers in different machine building. They might have different setups. Just to think about Java versioning. Now Java 9 came out. Okay, developers trying Java 9. Maybe build script is a little bit wrong. It's building with Java 9. You're deploying Java 8 virtual machine. Doesn't work. Production environment is manually installed. I've seen uh, this year two times that the two library cluster environments are not same. Two nodes, they are not same. Why one issue is happening in one node but not in the other? It's not same configuration, not good. It's very prone to human error. Of course, when Sara is a product owner and she's saying they're doing that and the CE is doing the access, acceptance testing. She's just trying out what she wants to see. Sometimes end users are precious for acceptance testings because they can find some errors that tester can't. But testers are professionals and they can actually test the system properly. They test all of the aspects they can th think of. And you in, neither should trust developers as a testing. They are not interested about testing their software. They are trying a happy case and then they deploy it. Even if they don't write unit tests, they are even worse than the case. So this is the cowboy development process. It's for Braid, Brave and Hue. So let's go to look a little bit better. So how, how this rock solid process would look like. Of course, 
the ideal world, the environment is much more complex. There are more environments. There are different roles. So the idea is that we can actually test the problem. So our development team now gets the input from Sara to, to develop a new feature. And the developer is again developing the... And of course, this developer is also use unit testing to make sure that the code is good. Unit testing allows the developers, of course, to uh, look their code more thoroughly and find errors during the development time. Then developer is storing information during the development in a, in a source control repository, which is Git. And you should use some kind of advanced repository like Git, which allows multiple branching, a lot of branches. So developer actually can uh, save multiple versions of their work on the, in their source control. When the work has been done, the developer will send pull request for upstream repository. From this, there is a, a continuous integration server which is monitoring the repository. And it's reading the software. It starts building it. It will run a unit test. It will run integration test for it. It will do automatic code analysis for it. It will deploy the product on the first test environment. It will run automatic smoke test and end to end test. These tests are from the browser to the, these tests are from the browser to the back end. So these are ended tests. It's just simulated tests that basically tester could do, but they are automated and they are run for every pull request. If something goes wrong on this test or unit test, integration test, the system will automatically report this to the developer. So nobody else is needed. This process is automatic. Nothing else is required. He gets report something wrong. He gets use case. He gets stack trace. And he can fix the problem. And then he can go back and send a pull request. And finally, test is fine. And then it goes to architect and the architect is reviewing the code. Architect, architect, architect can still refuse. Okay, I don't like the code. I don't like coding style. I don't like your architectural pattern. He can give the code back to the developer. I'm not accepting this pull request. And developer is fixing that. Until he gets the, the good results. If you go to Git, this is GitHub. This is actual life rate code, actual life rate pull request. Our architect, Brian Chan, is reviewing the code. And before he is reviewing the code, he should see all tests are passed. And these tests, they're integration tests. There might be also some uh, automatic other tests too. So if you want to actually go to your website and see what Brian is doing, brian.com. Live rate portal pool 50,001 example. I had to do 50,001 because 50,000 was broken. So, as Brian, our architect is merging the, re, uh, the changes to his repository. Again, continuous integration service is taking the job. Oh, there's a new comment building it, automated testing. Deploying second test environment. <coughs> and another one. And these test environments are for acceptance testings, acceptance testings. And then we tester is firing the robots against them. They might be fired automatically. Maybe tester is also doing manual exploratory test for that. And the result might be good. I used to be in a project before LifeRay, and we had this kind of process. I never had a green light. There was a one problem. Our code has a problem. It broke the functional tests. Or 
a test, ultimate tests were broken. So basically only, only had like green light. We had green light after the, my test lead said, okay, I tested this again and it's green. Then when it's green, we use continuous integration server to deploy our installation package to repository. We have like fire lay guys here and they are example having uh, Docker images. So you can build Docker image and store that. Fire lay guys can give you Docker image that you can build your library installation. And then you go on production and in the production what you do is that say again use continuous integration server and say, please install my <coughs> software on production. It will read the installation package from repository and install it on production. It's automated. People are coming to see the product, a lot of traffic, and they are having their library experience. They are happy. And then from the production, you usually get logs. You have APM tools like uh, uh, APM tools that gives you information there. And you should feed back this information you get from production also back to your development team. Oh. And the developers. So they can improve their project and the tests. So they actually will uh, work as a real production. They would simulate better in production. So the one of the most important components what you see here is the continuous integration server. So this was actually the robot was doing the most of the job what we have. It's a basically server which is monitoring the, the version control and do some tasks depending on it. It does builds for you because the constant server, it's a consistent builds. Always the same build, same JVM, controlled. It can run integration tests for you, and sometimes integration tests, they have a different kind of code we had to speed up. Uh, there are, it, it, it can also display statuses of the build, and this is very useful for the architects. For tools, you have a Jenkins, which is very popular, and I think this may be the best tool for the local environments. But uh, currently, if I would do the project, even though I don't have any experience, I probably would go on cloud services like Travis, because then you don't have to set up anything yourself. You can buy it just to give some money for them, and then you have a, a hidden platform also there. For production deployment, Jenkins can, can use different kind of tools. You can build dockers. You can use scripting of the uh, production scripting, automatic scripting. So there are Puppet, Ansible, Jeff. We also have a V deploy you can actually use. You can also actually, your <laughs> logo should be also here because the fire lay, you can always use. And they, they also have a long experience of doing uh, deployments. And the last thing what I'm gonna talk here is about testing. So the development process, we saw that there's a different kind of tests. There are end-to-end -end test, integration test, and also unit test. And this is actually bringing the quality for you. So we can actually look at this, this testing kind of like pyramid. So basically, if you are like a unit test, the execution time of these unit tests are very fast. It's not a snail, it's a race car. But there are so many of them, and they are testing your code all the aspects. But they are usually, and they are most numerous. And then we have integration tests, which are integrating, testing whole platform from the API down. And end end test, and these are usually more complex to do. So let's look them individually. So the unit test is the tool of the developer He's doing unit tests all the time and he's developing. When he's refactoring his code, he's probably refactoring the unit test. If you look to unit test code quality or cleanness of the unit test code, 
it should be cleaner code in a unit test than actually a real code. Because if you uh, <coughs> refactor your real code, you probably have to refactor your unit test. And you have a lot of code guarding your real code. Unit test is also documenting your code for another developer. If this breaks, you're doing something wrong. And then you can investigate, investigate why. You shouldn't do integrations. You, don't, you shouldn't go outside of the bundle or jar file, basically do anything else. If you have to go there, you have to mock that. And these should be fast to build. Then we have integration tests. And in Liferay, we are using Archelian. So this allows you, if you look Liferay architecture, you have a service pillar. You can actually test transactional tests up to the database from the API. It allows you to create a, a nice uh, uh, all aspect full, stateful, uh, you can test all of the aspects of your API and make sure it's working. And, and the probability it's, it's testing better than unit tests because it's actually testing with real data. And usually you are not using mocks. Some cases you might want. And uh, in the integration tests, uh, usually when you are using data, you have to clean your data, you have to clean your life rate. And one of the tips I want to give you here is that you have this feature in a life rate called portal instances. So they, it's called as a company. So before the test, you create a new portal instance. And when you run test, you delete that. Roll back. You can run again another test against that. I have an example for you. You can actually take a look of the Archelian tests. End-to-end -end tests basically are testing whole platform from the browser to the back end. We call this as a functional tests. It also includes the manual exploratory test. There are a lot of frameworks you can use. And uh, I have tried a little bit myself. I've been in a project which we are successfully using this robot framework. It's actually Finnish based. I have a look a little bit at Cucumber, looks nice. I've been also using Selenium. But this is the one of the tasks that uh, actually is not you as a developer architect to make choice. It's about a test lead. What the test lead wants to have, that's the tool he will. And this, this is his tool. So this ultimate end-to-end -end test feels like, uh, uh, like with Cucumber text, they feel like normal language. So there's a feature which is telling something, and inside these sen normal sentences, there are keywords that then, then are parsed inside the text, and they are used inside text. So you can actually show the product owner, okay, this is my test cases, and then you have another language to discuss with the product owner. And this is something I want to bring also, that before you are running the project and before you're going to production, you have to run performance test, always. Five minutes. So I've been in a project that wasn't, was having a lot of integrations, and we didn't do performance test. We could handle maybe three concurrent users. There are two users using the library at the same time, it was dying. Because the backend integration couldn't handle two, low, two calls at the same time. From performance test, you should actually, if, yeah, as a result, get the portal configuration improvements. You will get the GC settings. You might take some of the load away from Liferay. Of course, you will find out your bottlenecks of your code. And the performance tuning is also important that you simulate your user behavior. So it's the same as you expect in a production. And also the same amount of the users. So these are responsibilities of who is doing which test. So tester is basically doing end-to-end -end test, including performance tests, and developer responsibilities doing the integration and unit tests. So next question is, how do you know what has been tested? You can measure the quality by looking which code has gone through, through the testing. So basically, you can actually inject the tools that actually makes you report something like this, and they show that everything is red 
this code, there is no test run on it. What do you actually want to look? You want to look green. Everything is green. This is like ideal situation. It's not always happening, but it's kind of like. So basically, what you can measure, where you, what you can measure and where. You can measure these things in currently end-to-end -end tests, functional tests. You can have uh, all the environments probe like this, integration tests and unit tests. There are tools like Yakoko, Cobertura, Saga. And these services, you can put also the cloud, Coverall, CodeCov, IO. You can use local services like SonarCube. Here you have an example how to set up Yakoko for the, your Tomcat, so you can run Liferay. So if you just have Yakoko agent at the Catalina op op Opts, you can actually measure which code has been touched. And then you can see the code coverage from the, for your functional tests too, integration tests. But when you run unit test, you basically, you have to use Gradle or Maven plugin for it. So how big the code coverage should be? I would say that basically unit test, end-to-end -end test, not so high. It depends on the decision of test lead, but usually it's not high because you are not testing all of the exception cases. Integration test, maybe not either, not all of the end cases, it cannot handle. But unit test, it should be high. My opinion, if there's something simple that you shouldn't, that it's too simple to test, why not test it? If, it's, if you have setter and nobody else is using, and you still want to have that setter in your class, and nobody's really using it, try test for it. It doesn't take any time from you. So finally, we have a summary of this presentation. So first of all, in a LifeRay project, you have to understand the architecture and design of LifeRay. You have to understand our uh, developer KVATs and problems what we have in our architecture. At the team, the lesson here is that go to your manager. I want to have one tester at least on my project. Fire one developer, put one tester in, better. And then create automatic continuous integration in your deployment. I think with the cloud tools, it's very easy, almost done. And high, have high test coverage, all of your testing layers. And the performance test before going production is crucial. I don't do that ever again, because that when it happened to me, I was who was to blame, even though other people said it wasn't. It was me. Of course, it was my work. I was an architect of the project at that time. So thank you. There is a link that you can write down. So you can write under my gist. So I put all the links there and presentations here. The slides will be there. So I just collect this thing here. So it's just one place. There's a couple of links that you want to do. So. Also, my guest has some other nice things if you're gonna you want to explore. So, if you have any questions, please. Thank you. <laughs> Thirty-six minutes. Yes, I also like estimated. <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. Uh, thank you, Samsa. I think we we probably won't have time for questions, unfortunately, because well, we're going straight out to a break. But. Yeah. You uh, can come please. always to talk to me. I'm all, all evening here, so you can talk to me, raise these issues. And if you have some experience about automated testing on your project, I'm very, more than happy to discuss with you. I'm happy to hear of your experiences, as I kind of feel that I don't have, have a, like this full life cycle experience in a long time. So I, actually, I would like to know what kind of tools you are using. Thanks, Amsa. We'll be back at uh, 11.35 with a presentation from Simon Smith from Firelay uh, on Docker. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Amsa. Thank you.